The honorary degree will now be conferred. Mr. President, will you present the honorary degree candidate, Romeo Dallaire? Mr. Chancellor, the name Romeo Dallaire is synonymous with courage in the face of tragedy. A catalyst in the fight for justice, he has expressed with eloquence his passion for truth and captured our collective attention with his message of hope. Romeo Dallaire has said, if our vision is our self-interest and the advancement of our nations, there should also be a strategic focus on that higher plane called humanity. We are not allowed to abdicate that responsibility. These words reveal his faith in the worth and dignity of all human beings, and his life is a testament to those words. A highly decorated Lieutenant General, he served his country nobly for 35 years and earned the Meritorious Service Cross for bringing honor to our armed forces and the Vimy Award for significant contributions to the defense of Canada. As Force Commander of the United Nations Observer and Assistance Mission in Rwanda, he saw firsthand the kind of horror that most of us cannot even imagine. Despite the resulting catastrophe and the great personal toll it exacted, Romeo Dallaire emerged out of that dark period to become one of this country's most acclaimed national figures and a hero to all who stand for justice and decency. Since then, he has shared with audiences around the world his grueling experience of that time. And as a lecturer, public speaker, and as the author of Shake Hands with the Devil, he has made all of us face our responsibility to our fellow human beings. And he has done so with remarkable forthrightness, grace, and compassion. Romeo Dallaire is a moral exemplar for those who seek freedom and peace. His life is a remarkable example of the triumph of the human spirit. His public deeds have given us something to believe in and inspired not only the citizens of this country, but also like-minded people around the world. And in private, his bravery and leadership in the fight for freedom and peace in the international area are matched by his courage and example in battles against the personal demons of post-traumatic stress. Our government has recognized his selfless contributions by investing him in the Order of Canada, and just recently by appointment to the Senate. And today, we pay homage to this great leader. Mr. Chancellor, I am honored to ask on behalf of the Senate of Simon Fraser University that you now confer upon Senator Romeo Dallaire the degree Doctor of Laws honoris causa. Romeo Dallaire, by the virtue of the authority vested in me and in the Senate of this university, I hereby admit you to the degree Doctor of Laws honoris causa. Dr. Dallaire will be hooded by Dr. John Waterhouse, Vice President, Academics. It is my pleasure now to call on Dr. Romeo Dallaire for his convocation address. Collègues du Sénat, Monsieur le Juge en Chef, Monsieur le Chancelier, Monsieur le Président, camp professoral, parents, amis et gradués aujourd'hui, bonjour et félicitations. I am going to address you not in my mother tongue, which is Québécois, or some 
friends in France would say 18th century French. And although it is ideal soldier weather, I will not uh, speak uh, too long a period. If the chancellor can quote uh, as a new philosopher a rock star, I think I can quote a baseball player, American of course, who said a number of decades ago, the future ain't what it used to be. And in fact, as I look at not just graduates with the knowledge, with the skills, and hopefully gaining the experience in their each professions and orders, I am also looking at leaders, leadership. And leadership is anticipation of the future. Leadership is molding the future. Leadership is not surviving the future. Leadership is not management by crisis but on the contrary, it is moving into the future with an idea, a vision, a thought, and bringing concrete proposals from that. But what of the backdrop that has brought you to this leadership role and be part of the leadership strata of this great nation? Let me give you an example, being a soldier of a soldier experience and try to bring that to this institution and what I hope you've captured and what you will bring forward into the future of this nation. A young lieutenant who had graduated from the Royal Military College a couple years previous was in Rwanda and was leading a platoon of about 30 soldiers as they entered a village that had been massacred very recently. And as they made their way through the village at the other end there was a large ditch in which a number of young girls, young women who had been mutilated and raped were left dying as a number of young children. And in Rwanda, before the bloodletting, there was over 30% of HIV AIDS and so a very high risk for people of contracting it. Soldiers don't walk around with rubber gloves and protected gear. And so the lieutenant uh, seeing these people in the throes of death had two options. Does he command his troops to leap into the ditch and provide some solace to these people who were dying and maybe, maybe saving one or attempting to save one or two and risk being infected? Or does he order his troops not to go into the ditch and to keep on going because really the risk is too high and we can't do much anyway, so why not let them die? Now at that time under my command I had 26 nations who were providing me with troops. And so I went to the contingent commander of each of those nations who had troops there. And I said, what would your platoon commander do? 23 of the 26 nations said that their platoon commander would order the soldiers not to go in and keep on going, it wasn't worth it, and they're gonna die anyways. Three countries said they would go in, the Dutch, the Ghanaians, in 1962 when Ghana got its independence from the UK, it turned to Canada and I remember training with Ghanaian officers and we still train them today. The Ghanaians said they'd go in and the other one was the Canadian. Except the young platoon commander, new leader, young leader in the army had a serious problem because by the time he turned around to order his troops to go into the ditch, they were already in the ditch. They were already there saving. What makes us do that? What led them to leap in there on their own with the risk and attempting to save? Well, ladies and gentlemen, and you, the graduates, what makes us do that, not only on that occasion, but consistently, and not only soldiers, but humanitarians and diplomats, as we're seen around the world, what makes us go in where we see suffering and people abused are institutions like this. It's our society, it's the values, the ethics, the moral references. It's the sense of humanity. For in this nation, we have criteria that has made us now a responsible component of humanity. It's been thrust upon us. We have a very strong work ethic. Look at what we've done. We have a strong mastery of technology. We believe in the fundamental element of human rights and all humans are human and not one is more human than the other. 
and we have no grand imperial ambitions to subjugate anybody else. Those are the criteria of a nation that has as its perspective not its town, its province, or its borders. It has as a perspective the whole of humanity. It is a nation that perceives itself part of the ongoing movement of humanity to a much more human world, a world where conflict will dissipate in the face, in the face of human rights and the advancement of it. And in you, the future leaders, who are going to take up that mantra and going to push it farther, you have spoken in even more confident fashion than my generation and generations previous to us. In World War II, this nation had 11 million people of population, of which about 7 million could serve in the military. And we sent in World War II 1 million men and women, a proportion unequaled in the world of commitment. And even with that commitment, we were not at the decision tables. We were that young colony that when we turn to will provide because they're good people and they'll do it. And so we felt ourselves as being, yeah, the young nation facing the great older nations of the world and doing our bit. Well, that is not what drives your generation as I've been able to capture across this country over the last four or five years speaking to different universities and high schools. What you're saying is, no, we're not no more the young kid on the block who answers to someone else's call. We are mature, young adults. We're in our late 20s, early 30s. We're confident. We're cocky. We have skills. We have a mind of our own. We have our own strategic vision of this nation and the world. And our vision in the world is the advancement of humanity, of making people honestly look at each other and say there is absolutely no difference between us. We are both equal humans. And so to you, ladies and gentlemen, the future leaders of this nation, you have already the vision that this country has a responsibility to humanity that goes beyond simply getting us to Mars. It in fact sees that the 80% of humanity that's still in the mud and the, the blood and the groveling and inhuman conditions, that that 80% must see hope and opportunity to the future and live as human beings. And as such, you will, I am confident, move us beyond our borders and take the leadership role that so many nations in this world expect us to take and not underestimate what we can do, but in fact thrive on the strength and the dynamics and the fundamental beliefs of this nation. And following the edict that all humans are human and there isn't one more human than another. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Delaire.